All right. Thanks for the introduction. Pablo, so I want to take the time and, and for 10 minutes tell you something about MIRTH. MIRTH is an NSF-sponsored engineering research center. Uh, it's a consortium of six universities. Princeton is the lead. We have about 40 faculty, 100 plus students, uh, year-round 140 students uh, in the summer. And what the center is doing, it takes a technology that's just coming out of the research labs and tries to push it out into the real world. And to do that, uh, it works very closely with industry. And the technology that we are pushing out into the real world is mid-infrared laser-based trace gas sensing. So it's any, anything that's related with having a gas sample and wanting to know what chemicals are in there uh, at very small quantities, parts per billion, parts per trillion sensitivity. So examples that come to mind, air pollution, urban air quality, indoor air quality, but also sensing uh, for long-term uh, air pollution. It is um, what amount of carbon is human generated, which one is just natural carbon. Think about uh, cap and trade, for example. So it's sensing of chemicals. It's also, uh, if, you, if you switch from pollution and environmental to medical, it's breath analysis. If I breathe out, my breath has all kinds of chemicals in there. I can detect them. I can diagnose, monitor uh, disease, and so on. It's also process control. It's automotive control. So it's sensing of chemicals. If you look at the sensor market, it's huge. Right? There are plenty of sensors. But essentially, it falls into uh, a couple categories. There are those that are cheap. That's your carbon monoxide sensor. It's cheap, easy to, um, to install. Everyone knows how to use it. But it's not sensitive enough. And then you have the other part of sensors that are wonderful sensors, sensitive enough. But they need a PhD to operate. They're expensive. They're bulky. You couldn't afford more than a few of them. So what's missing is a very high-end sensing technology, parts per billion technology, at a consumer product level. And we have a new technology. It's semiconductor-based uh, spectroscopy. And being semiconductor-based, it should sit on the same curve as other semiconductor-based materials on a more curve. The more you need, uh, the cheaper they get. And so the ultimate goal is a small, tiny, cell phone-sized sensor that measures chemicals, vapors, at, at very small quantities. Right. So we build little things, right? Uh, sensors. Uh, how do we do that? It's an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary research effort where we combine the expertise of climate scientists. This is aerosols above Princeton on a sunny day. Uh, medical expertise, breath analysis, with electrical engineering. This is a wireless module. It has all the electronics to run the system, to detect the system on it. We talk about components. This is actually a gas sensing cell. It's about this tiny. Um, and components laser research. And why does it work? Well, if you think of trace gases, in the mid-infrared wavelength range, they have color. They have unique colors. And so if we can make lasers that match the colors of trace gases, we can detect them by absorption. So here's an example for ammonia. Um, in the mid-infrared wavelength range, it has the, the strongest absorption lines, the strongest optical features. And so that's where we want to catch the trace gas and detect it. Um, just to make the point, different trace gases, they're all important ones, each one looks different and very characteristic in that wavelength range. And so we have projects, you know, 40 faculty, 100 plus students need a lot of projects to work on that are urban air quality sensing, regional climate, breath analysis, homeland security applications. It's sensor systems. It's point sensors, measuring a gas sample here and now. It is remote sensors, integrating over a couple hundred meters, about, uh, integrating over a kilometer to match um, climate models, for example. It's sensor networks. Sensor networks is coming up very strongly. And then the little components that go into those systems um, that build the, build the whole uh, thing. Research. That was the research we are doing. A center such as ours has two more pillars. So it's the research and then it has education and industry outreach. Here are education programs. Um, they're more lively if you put pictures to it. But essentially, we graduate students who are better trained, 
because they're more cross-disciplinary trained. They have visited more than just one university. They, many of them take internships in industry. Many take international internships. So they're pretty much, uh, they're very well versed in collaborating in interacting with a variety of people uh, when they graduate. And then, uh, as, as Greg already mentioned, uh, Greg Olson already mentioned, we work with industry. We have an active industry collaboration program where we provide membership uh, at various different levels, where we provide uh, services at various different levels, and we receive feedback, input, but also monetary uh, cash contributions. And here's the list of our current uh, members. And you see that it's small businesses, large businesses. 70% of our industry members are, in fact, small business and startups. And since our inception, MIRTH, in two, 2006, uh, we have not lost a single company. We've only been growing in number of companies that we work with. All right, if I have two, three more minutes, left, um, I thought I should tell you something uh, about the technology we are doing. And um, we're doing a lot of things. So I pick one, one thing. And the one thing I pick is uh, our field campaign last summer at the Olympic Games um, in Beijing, where we brought uh, two instruments to do trace gas sensing and a group of uh, environmental weather pollution forecasting modeling Right, so the pollution forecasting folks were part of the local team of scientists that provides feedback to the International Olympic Committee um, about pollution and, and the games. Right, so why did we go uh, to Beijing and why am I showing you this? Uh, first of all, it is to be part of something real. And so um, sometimes universities are accused of not being really part of the real world, I want to show you that we are part of the real world. We can get, especially engineers, we can get out there, our student groups, and be part of something where it matters. And Olympic Games do matter. So being part of something important. Um, next thing, it's a unique time series experiment in terms of civil and environmental engineering. That's extremely um, uh, recent too. The question is, can a community influence on the short term its air quality? Right? Could New York City improve its air quality if it would put in uh, congestion pricing? How do you do that experiment? That would be a very hard experiment to do. Here, uh, we had a wonderful experiment because factories were shut down, car traffic was diminished to uh, odd even day driving, um, trucks traffic was diminished. And the question is, can you actually clean up the air? And the answer is yes, it works really well. And finally, we wanted to test our um, equipment. And so we had actually three ammonia, carbon dioxide, and ozone that we were after, because you can measure them, and they look very characteristic in the mid-infrared. And so we, we measured those trace gases with our experimental equipment. And the, the, the system's about this big. Well, it was an open path system. Where it sends out the laser beam, 75 meters, beam comes back, and we measure along this uh, beam path. It was about two miles from uh, the, the, the main Olympic sites. Um, we also compared it with the official instruments. And you go there and you see the official instruments, they're all from US companies, and there's a big box that measures ozone, and then there's a big box that measures ammonia, and then there's a somewhat smaller box that measures CO2. Uh, and our box is about as big, but it can measure everything. All right, uh, here's the example. This is ozone, uh, day, night cycle, and our instruments test as well or better as, as the other instruments. All right, but just to show, we, we took out 10 students, uh, some faculty, we all had fun, but we also were part of something important. And so as a professor here, working with industry uh, is another opportunity be part of something real and something important. So we listen to you what are important problems that need good solutions. And I think we are ready to, to help uh, work on these things. Thank you. Thank you.
So I'd like to spend the next uh, few minutes telling you a little bit about the Anlinger Center and some of the logistics about uh, this meeting. Um, the Anlinger Center, uh, as many of you may know, was established in July of 2008, thanks to an extraordinary gift from Princeton alumnus and international business leader Gerhard Anlinger. The center has three core areas of research. So we would like the center to support a vibrant research and teaching program with a focus on three things, developing new alternative energy sources, improving the efficiency of devices that consume and generate energy today, and inventing and improving carbon capture and storage techniques that will enhance our ability to reduce the amount of CO2 entering the atmosphere. So these are three broad themes. The center aims at pursuing these studies closely with scientists and policy analysts across the university. And this is very important, with an eye towards translating fundamental knowledge into practical solutions. This is built into the core mission of the center. We envision the center to be located in what we call a neighborhood, energy and environment neighborhood, which will comprise the E-wing of the engineering school, Bowen Hall, which is where the Prism Center uh, stands, and the Carfield Center, which will move across the street, whereas uh, we, we intend to have a, a very nice conference center in that location associated with the Anlinger Center. And there will be, very importantly, a state-of-the-art facility. A major theme will be within the center will be to bring together the finest minds in energy and environmental science with those who work on new materials. This was a strategic choice that Princeton made to capitalize on an existing strength. For example, to develop flexible solar panels or to develop heat resistance coatings that will enable power plants to operate more efficiently. And you're going to hear about both of these themes today. So accordingly, the new center will host a state-of-the-art facility, a shared facility that will have state-of-the-art imaging and nanofabrication facilities in addition to individual investigator labs. Because of the focus on translating fundamental knowledge into practical solutions, close interactions with industry will be, to, from day one, fundamental to the existence of the center. And planning for the new building therefore includes space for industrial collaboration laboratories as well as for hosting industrial visitors for extended periods of time. We selected the architects in January, uh, Todd Williams and Billy Seen, a firm, a New York based firm, and we're in the middle of the design process for the center. The search committee has identified a candidate for the director of the center and we're now in the middle of negotiations, trying to attract this person to Princeton. So we're very excited. We're sort of in the, in the quiet but very active phase. A lot of things are happening. Speaking about the director, uh, in, 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 in going with the theme of the importance of industrial contacts, the director will consult with two external advisory boards. One will be focused on scientific issues and will be primarily but not exclusively academic. And the other board will be focused on strategic and policy concerns and will be mostly composed of people from industry. In addition, the director will oversee the recruiting of new faculty to the center, will oversee the development of the energy and environment neighborhood, provide leadership of research, educational, and outreach activities, and also, very importantly, allocate a non-trivial amount of funds for innovative research internally at Princeton. So, Today's meeting is the first of what we hope to be many meetings. And when we thought about the format, of course, we didn't know what sort of response we would get. We got a very good response. And so we have to cram everyone into just 10 minutes. So the format will be talks. We have two coffee breaks and a reception for people to mingle and, and follow up. We want the industrialists to hear about the exciting research going on here and programs that exist. And we want the academics to hear about the needs and interests in industry. And hopefully, the two coffee breaks and the reception will allow for plenty of opportunity for people to talk. If time allows and we're doing OK with the uh, timing, right before the reception, we'll also have a little bit of open discussion. But if you don't have enough of structured discussion, please be proactive. Contact the faculty members or the faculty members contact industry.
council members whose presentations you're interested in, and be aware that this is just the first of many forums that we intend to organize. Um, this is all I wanted to say, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Olson, who's my partner in crime in organizing this. Greg is a lecturer in the Electrical Engineering Department, and of course is president and founder of GHO Ventures. Jeff? Thank you. As uh, Pablo mentioned, uh, I'm entrepreneur in residence here. One of my functions is to meet with uh, faculty and students about, uh, you know, ideas for starting new companies or spinning off technologies. And you know, I've enjoyed uh, that part of my being here. But uh, let me start off with what the perp what I see the purpose of this meeting is. Uh, first of all, does this make sense? You know, now to me it makes a lot of sense, but. I'd rather hear that from you than uh, you know, my own thoughts. Uh, give you an opportunity to see what faculty are working on here. Uh, faculty can see what the local companies are doing. Uh, it's a lot better to meet and interact and have coffee and we have a reception afterwards rather than just read about stuff in uh, newspapers and trade journals. And of course, is to determine what the next steps are. How do we go forward from here? So after this meeting, we'll kind of you know, make some notes, distribute them, and go to plan B. A uh, little bit of history. You know, Princeton's had a number of really successful uh, industrial academic uh, interactions. And I just put three of them up here, but uh, there are many more. These are the ones I've been involved with. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was a POEM Center for uh, Photonics and Optoelectronic Materials. Jim Sturm was heavily involved in uh, creating that. Uh, PRISM, that, that sort of morphed into Princeton, which combined uh, materials uh, with the optoelectronics. Uh, and then finally, uh, most recently, we have Mirth with uh, Prof. Claire Gamakel, and I'm not going to uh, steal her thunder. I'll let, you, uh, let her tell you about it. But that's also been a very successful uh, industrial interaction. Uh, just to give you my personal uh, interaction, my history with Princeton and these types of academic uh, uh, interactions. Uh, I've had two startup companies, one Epitax in 1984, and the second one is called Sensors Unlimited. Uh, Epitax was more fiber optics, Sensors Unlimited was fiber optics and also infrared imaging. Um, I got involved with Steve Forrest, who was on the faculty. He joined in 1992. About the same time, uh, Marshall Cohen and I started uh, Sensors Unlimited. And it was really a synergistic thing. And POEM, which was then the Industrial uh, Affiliates Center, really provided the nucleus for us to interact. Steve was coming uh, in. He needed to set up his uh, equipment, get his students going. We were starting a company. You know, we had engineers, but we didn't have a lot of equipment and facilities. So via joint R&D programs, we were able to share these things and both you know, really benefited from them. Uh, lots of student jobs, not only summer jobs. I think at Census, we probably hired maybe close to uh, 10 uh, Princeton graduates. Uh, we licensed patents. Uh, it was just a really nice interaction. Uh, between these two companies, NetNet, uh, it was over a billion dollars in, in sale. Uh, over a thousand jobs were created. And one of the best part is we were able to pay back over a hundred million dollars to the government in the form of corporate and payroll taxes. So it was really a win-win-win for everybody. And I give a lot of the credit for both of these companies to you know, the centers that existed at Princeton University. So what I'm trying to do is to tell you it's really worked for me and it can work for you too by getting involved with the university. Uh, as I said, it's been a great deal for everybody. Um, again, uh, the Mirth Center, I'm going to let uh, Prof. Gamakal tell you more about that. But uh, they've attracted companies from all over the United States that participate in it. Uh, in fact, I was down at uh, a, a trade show called Clio uh, last week in Baltimore, and I see they had their own uh, booth at a trade show. So, uh, you know, it's really been an active organization and really gets out and interacts uh, with the world. 
Now, you know, if I was an industrial member, you know, if I hadn't been involved in these things, I might say, well, how can a university help me? And, you know, just a couple, I think you're going to find out by listening to these talks. Uh, but I, I think one of the best ways is by joint funding programs. Um, my companies have used the SBIR system, Small Business Innovation Research. It's a funding system the government has for small businesses. But now with the stimulus program, there's a lot of other things going on. with The Department of Energy, most recently these ARPA-E programs, but there are going to be more as the stimulus stuff evolves. And many, many of these programs either encourage or require uh, companies to interact, to have universities on their programs, and vice versa, the universities to go out and find industrial participation. So I think the stimulus program is, you know, just one of many ways that this can interact. You know, at first glance, nanotechnologies and lasers, you know, what, what does that have to do with me? Well, you know, that may sound a little foreign to you or a little bit up in the clouds, but when you get into pollution monitoring and gas sensing, then it's not so far removed, because I think a lot of you uh, deal with things like that. Um, let's turn it around. How can companies help universities? Just make them aware of the problems you have. Um, an outlet for technology. There's a lot of great technology here, and if you get to talk to the people, uh, this is how you'll find out. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience, Princeton's very easy to work with. Um, you know, John Ritter, in, in terms of licensing, he's, he's just, he's a deal maker. You know, and you won't sit there for, you know, tens of meetings or get to the point. And uh, we found him, we've worked with him for over 20 years, and we found not just John, but the whole university to be really easy uh, and, and friendly to work with. So I think that's the end of my comments. Uh, I think next on the uh, schedule is supposed to be the funding lady, uh, Paula Durand. I, I don't see her here yet, so I think what we'll do is uh, maybe start on, if, if you don't mind starting a little early, Claire, um, get on with that part of it, and when Paula comes in, we'll just have her talk about the uh, funding programs available for the state. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Pablo, so I want to take the time and, and for 10 minutes tell you something about MIRTH. MIRTH is an NSF-sponsored engineering research center. Uh, it's a consortium of six universities. Princeton is the lead. We have about 40 faculty, 100 plus students, uh, year-round 140 students uh, in the summer. And what the center is doing, it takes a technology that's just coming out of the research labs and tries to push it out into the real world. And to do that, uh, it works very closely with industry. And the technology that we are pushing out into the real world is mid-infrared laser-based trace gas sensing. So it's any, anything that's related with having a gas sample and wanting to know what chemicals are in there uh, at very small quantities, parts per billion, parts per trillion sensitivity. So examples that come to mind, air pollution, urban air quality, indoor air quality, but also sensing uh, for long-term uh, air pollution. It is um, what amount of carbon is human generated, which one is just natural carbon. Think about uh, cap and trade, for example. So it's sensing of chemicals. It's also, uh, if, you, if you switch from pollution and environmental to medical, it's breath analysis. If I breathe out, my breath has all kinds of chemicals in there. If I can detect them, I can diagnose monitor uh, disease and so on. It's also process control. It's automotive control. So it's sensing of chemicals. And if you look at the sensor market, it's huge. Right? There are plenty of sensors. But essentially, it falls into uh, a couple categories. There are those that are cheap. That's your carbon monoxide sensor. It's cheap, easy to, um, to install. Everyone knows how to use it. But it's not sensitive enough. And then you have the other part of sensors that are wonderful sensors, sensitive enough but they need a PhD to operate, they're expensive, they're bulky. You couldn't afford more than a few of them. So what's missing is a very high-end sensing technology, parts per billion technology, at a consumer product level. And we have a new technology 
it's semiconductor-based uh, spectroscopy. And being semiconductor-based, it should sit on the same curve as other semiconductor-based materials on a Moore curve. The more you need, uh, the cheaper they get. So the ultimate goal is a small, tiny, cell phone-sized sensor that measures chemicals, vapors, at, at very small quantities. Right. So we build little things, right? Uh, sensors. Uh, how do we do that? It's an interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary research effort. Well, we combine the expertise of climate scientists. This is aerosols above Princeton on a sunny day. Uh, medical expertise, breath analysis, with electrical engineering. This is a wireless module. It has all the electronics to run the system, to detect the system on it. We talk about components. This is actually a gas sensing cell. It's about this tiny. Um, and components, laser research. And why does it work? Well, if you think of trace gases, in the mid-infrared wavelength range, they have color. They have unique colors. And so if we can make lasers that match the colors of trace gases, we can detect them by absorption. So here's an example for ammonia. Um, in the mid-infrared wavelength range, it has the, the strongest absorption lines, the strongest optical features. And so that's where we want to catch the trace gas and detect it. Um, just to make the point, different trace gases, they're all important ones, each one looks different and very characteristic in that wavelength range. And so we have projects, you know, 40 faculty, 100 plus students need a lot of projects to work on that are urban air quality sensing, regional climate, breath analysis, homeland security applications. It's sensor systems, it's point sensors, measuring a gas sample here and now. It is remote sensors, integrating over a couple hundred meters, about, uh, integrating over a kilometer to match um, climate models, for example. It's sensor networks. Sensor networks is coming up very strongly. And then the little components that go into those systems um, that build the, build the whole uh, thing. Research. That was the research we are doing. A center such as ours has two more pillars. So it's the research, and then it has education and industry outreach. We have education programs. Um, they're more lively if you put pictures to it. But essentially, we graduate students who are better trained because they're more cross-disciplinary trained. They have visited more than just one university. They, many of them take internships in industry. Many take international internships. So they're pretty much, uh, they're very well versed in collaborating and interacting with a variety of people uh, when they graduate. And then, uh, as, as uh, Greg already mentioned, uh, Greg Olson already mentioned, we work with industry. We have an active industry collaboration program where we provide membership uh, at various different levels, where we provide uh, services at various different levels, and we receive feedback, input, but also monetary uh, cash contributions. And here is the list of our current uh, members. And you see that it's small businesses, large businesses. 70% of our industry members are, in fact, small business and startup. And since our inception, Mirth in two, 2006, uh, we have not lost a single company. We've only been growing in number of companies that we work with. All right, if I have two, three more minutes left, um, I thought I should tell you something uh, about the technology we are doing. And um, we're doing a lot of things. So I pick one, one thing. And the one thing I pick is uh, our field campaign last summer at the Olympic Games um, in Beijing, where we brought uh, two instruments to do trace gas sensing and a group of uh, environmental weather pollution forecasting modeling people. Right? So the pollution forecasting folks were part of the local team of scientists that provides feedback to the International Olympic Committee um, about pollution and, and the games. Right, so why did we go uh, to Beijing and why am I showing you this? Uh, first of all, it is to be part of something real. And so um, sometimes universities are accused of not being really part of the real world. 
I want to show you that we are part of the real world. We can get, especially engineers, we can get out there, our student groups, and be part of something where it matters. And Olympic Games do matter. So being part of something important. Um, next thing, it's a unique time series experiment in terms of civil and environmental engineering. That's extremely um, uh, recent too. The question is, can a community influence on the short term its air quality? Right? Could New York City improve its air quality if it would put in uh, congestion pricing? How do you do that experiment? That would be a very hard experiment to do. Here, uh, we had a wonderful experiment because factories were shut down, car traffic was diminished to uh, odd even day driving, um, trucks traffic was diminished. And the question is, can you actually clean up the air? And the answer is yes, it works really well. And finally, we wanted to test our um, equipment. And so we had actually three ammonia, carbon dioxide, and ozone that we were after because you can measure them and they look very characteristic in the mid-infrared. And so we, we measured those trace gases with our experimental equipment. And the, the, the system's about this big. Well, it was an open path system where it sends out the laser beam 75 meters, beam comes back, and we measure along this uh, beam path. It was about two miles from uh, the, the, the main Olympic sites. Um, we also compared it with the official instruments. And you go there and you see the official instruments, they're all from US companies, and there's a big box that measures ozone, and then there's a big box that measures ammonia, and then there's a somewhat smaller box that measures CO2. Uh, and our box is about as big, but it can measure everything. All right, uh, here's the example. This is ozone, uh, day-night cycle, and our instruments test as well or better as, as the other instruments. All right, but just to show, we, we took out 10 students, uh, some faculty, we all had fun, but we also were part of something important. And so as a professor here, working with industry uh, is another opportunity be part of something real and something important. So we listen to you what are important problems that need good solutions. And I think we are ready to, to help uh, work on these things. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. I apologize for that. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, thank you, Pablo, for the introduction. My name is Craig Arnold. Uh, I'm in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, I'm also with the uh, Princeton Institute for Science and Technology and Materials. And today I want to tell you just a little bit about the kinds of things we do in my group related to energy storage, uh, particularly things related to how we can optimize electrochemical energy storage devices. Think of things like batteries or capacitors and such like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to meet some of these challenges by understanding the nanostructures, how we can optimize them, understanding the mechanics and how that relates to the electrochemistry, and also doing some advanced laser processing type approaches um, to see how we can further optimize these systems. First off, my group, as well as the funding agencies, in particular I want to thank Elena and Christina, um, two of my students who are doing uh, much of the work I'm talking about here. Now clearly energy storage is important. I don't need to give you a full background on this. Um, you could think of a variety of reasons why you care. Um, a car, an iPhone, wind power, all of these things, right? If it's wind or solar, the wind isn't always blowing or the sun's not always shining. Um, there we go, good. Um, so you need to worry about how you might load level these types of systems. Um, in, in other cases, you might think of having a need for extra energy. Um, in the case of the iPhone or a car or something, you might think of something being portable. Um, and finally, perhaps most importantly, is that novel systems require novel solutions. And you know, the, the constant question I get is, well, can you just make a single battery? Can you make some magic system that will solve all of our energy needs? And the answer is, is well, it's not that simple. Because each particular system has particular demands that we have to meet. And so one has to look at different things, such as, should the battery be flexible? Does it need long life or lightweight? Or other types of metrics that you care about. And so clearly, energy storage is one of the key challenges we faced in, in the 21st century. Um, but also, 
Um, you might think of, say, uh, semiconductor or electronics, and we think of something like Moore's Law, where the, uh, the storage uh, capacity in a computer doubles every 18 months. Well, unfortunately, for batteries, that doesn't quite work. Uh, in the case of batteries, the doubling time is about 60 years. Um, so clearly something's up here. What's going on? Why does it take so long? And well, the answer is, is that the chemistries haven't changed much, but the way we understand these systems and the way we apply these systems to other types of devices start becoming very important. Now, in particular, in my group, we focus on three main areas in energy storage, uh, batteries, supercapacitors, as well as some recent work looking at how we can integrate systems and build up larger things. And some of the particular topics are listed here. But the key thing that I want you to take home from these different areas in our group is that with respect to batteries, we care about making batteries small. We care about making them long lasting so that you can have many, many cycles that go into them. And we care about advanced applications. Again, thinking about things like flexible platforms or very small micro batteries, things like that. And um, in just very briefly in the next couple slides, I'll talk about two of these things. I'll talk about the relationship between mechanical and electrochemical properties as well as some advanced laser processing and embedding of micro batteries. In the case of supercapacitors, um, what you can think about is the way we try to control the nanoscale structures. We try to optimize the size scale of these materials. We try to reach very high powers, make these systems faster. Um, and again, we look to novel applications. How can we implement small scale ultracapacitors, maybe flexible ultracapacitors, things like that. Um, and finally, on integration systems, we look at questions like how do we integrate storage with alternative energy? Um, how would you put a battery with a wind windmill or a wind turbine? Um, what type of battery do you need? Um, and also hybrid types of systems for small scale applications. And in the case of supercapacitors, I'll just very briefly talk about these two topics on optimizing the architecture as well as, again, some advanced uh, laser processing. So let's start off on batteries um, in this lightning quick tour of electrochemical energy storage, two minutes here, right? Um, there's a real common misunderstanding about batteries. People think that they fail because the chemistry dies or the battery gets used up or things like that. But when you're talking about rechargeable batteries, the typical mode of failure is actually mechanical in nature. Um, you can think of your, the laptop batteries that were blowing up you know, a little while back. That's clearly a mechanical failure. Um, but you, know, you might think of a flexible battery where you bend it, maybe some kind of fiber. Um, but this is also true in fixed batteries. And the way to understand that is that lithium batteries, the ions have to intercalate into the host lattice. What that means is that large ions have to squeeze themselves in between the planes of atoms that are already there. And so, for instance, you might have ions coming in. Once they combine with their electron, this whole thing grows just a little bit. Now, this could be a tremendous amount of strain on the systems, on the order of 7 to 10 percent. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's enough to destroy most materials. And so it's actually critical to understand the relationship between the mechanics in these systems and how that affects the electrochemistry. And this ultimately can lead to improved lifetime. So if we can stop the system from failing mechanically, we could get this system to last longer. And so the type of experiment you might think about, um, you might think of a flexible battery, but as I said, traditional batteries as well. Um, and the kind of thing we do is we might squeeze these things. We might you know, press on them a little bit. and We might see how they respond understand some of the electrochemical and mechanical interactions. You know, so for instance, you might think of you know, mechanical terms like fatigue or stress or strain. But if we put that into the, set, into the battery terminology, we're really looking at the cycle life. We're looking at the energy density or the power density in these types of systems. Um, so that's sort of topic one main area. Um, in the case of laser processing on these systems, when you start throwing lasers into the mix, you can start doing all sorts of novel types of changes to the materials in the system. Um, and one particular thing that I want to talk about is a laser direct right embedding approach. And again, there's a lot of details here. But really, all you need to keep in mind is that what we can do is we can use a laser to modify a surface where we want to put a battery. We can drill a hole or something. We can then print a battery directly in that hole and cover it up so you couldn't even see the battery after the fact. Um, and so here's a picture of it over here. Um, this is the subject of a recent patent of ours. Um, and you can see here's a, here's a small here's a dime. Here's a picture of the battery. If you look at it on the side, you might have an anode, a cathode, all embedded within a substrate. So you wouldn't even see the thing. Very small. Um, here's some other general pictures. But in general, when you start throwing laser printing methods into the electrochemistry, 
um, you could start actually making real systems, real devices, that have significant amount of energy density as well as power density per unit area. So small scale applications, once again, novel types of, 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 of implementations of energy storage. Okay, so that's the quick bit on batteries, the quick thing on supercapacitors. Many of you might not know what a supercapacitor is. Uh, basically, you could think of a supercapacitor as kind of like a battery and kind of like a capacitor. Okay? It's very fast like a capacitor. It can give up its energy very rapidly, but it could store a lot of energy just like a battery. And basically, the way it works is you have a really high surface area. If you put a lot of surface area, you have a lot of place for these chemical reactions to occur. Um, and there's various different types of flavors, details, details. Uh, but in general, one of the things that you're really striving for in these systems is how can I engineer a material that has a very high active surface area that I can somehow process into an appropriate device that I'm interested in. Um, and so, you know, supercapacitors have a number of advantages over batteries. Um, you know, this was, this was a slide I put together for an animal tracking uh, symposium. But basically, they have a greater cycle. They can cycle many, many times. They have very high power. They're very good at charging and discharging. But they have a relatively low energy density compared to batteries. They have a shorter shelf life. Um, so in general, the way to think of these systems is to think of a Ragoni chart like this. And so you might think of fuel cells as being very high in energy but low in power. Uh, capacitors are somewhere in the middle. And so we play all sorts of games with these systems trying to make them better, trying to make them more useful in various types of applications. Um, so for instance, one of the things we do is we look at optimizing the nanostructure. Um, how can you um, uh, make more surface area for a given material? Um, so for instance, uh, we might use carbon nanotubes or other types of nanostructured materials. And I'm just about out of time, right? I'm long past out of time. Um, so, oh, OK. I could speak even faster. I will, no, I will, be, I will be closer for the rest of my He's standing. He's getting, as, when he starts pulling me off, um, so, so I, you know, we could, again, deal with these nanostructures. We can deal with various uh, types of uh, situations related to these things. Um, the last thing I want to leave you with, and it, truly, it really is the last thing I promise, um, is, again, how you can further increase your ability to process these materials when you start using lasers. You can start playing some real neat tricks. Um, for instance, I can actually create a capacitor using two lasers to basically modify the material in such a way that the end result is I have a capacitor left behind. Um, and so all of that aside, let me just conclude with leaving this slide up here to tell you a little bit about the kinds of things we do. And thank you for listening to my rambling here. And I, um, I'll be around and we can chat later. Or something. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>
Um, we think we put together, uh, I should say, Ed Law really put together a dream team, uh, at least that's what the reviewers said, so I can say that, um, uh, of people to work on this problem. And so I'll talk more about that very briefly. Um, Pablo mentioned, I've been working for over a dozen years now looking at materials issues associated with the extreme conditions inside jet engines. In particular, uh, these jet engines are not only used to power aircraft, of course, but they're also used uh, in stationary power plants, different size modules, obviously. But the, but the materials are, issues are precisely the same. What you see on, there is somewhere a pointer, but I don't see it. So I should have taken yours then. It's right in your slide. That's okay. 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 So, how did I miss it? Okay. Oh, I see. No, that's all right. Anyway, so, um, so what we've been doing is to try to understand the issues associated with how you protect these these metal jet engine blades uh, at, that operate actually at temperatures above their melting point. That should frighten all of you. That you all take airplane trips, right? And these, these things are, are subject to the, fla the flame temperatures in these engines actually are above the melting point of the metal alloy that's used um, for, these, for these jet engine blades. How does that work? It works because they're protected by a ceramic coating, a very, very interesting ceramic coating. And we have been involved in multi-layer ceramic coating. We've been involved in understanding how to improve that coating so that one can operate at even higher temperatures and get and improve the fuel efficiency or improve thrust if that's your goal. Um, for flying. Okay, another area that was recently um, funded, we've done a little bit of work uh, related to this. Uh, this is a, a very nice picture of the uh, experimental fusion reactor that is going up in Europe that um, the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab has been involved in. They inspired me to start thinking about some of the materials issues associated with, with containing um, the, the, the fusion plasma. There are, are really important issues, as you can imagine. The temperatures get very high. There are neutron fluxes that come out of the fusion plasma um, such that you, we need to understand, um, and there's also the particular issue they're worried about that they asked me to think about has to do with, uh, with tritium, or, uh, which is a hydrogen isotope, uh, getting into the metal that, is, that uh, faces the plasma. So I'll talk about that very briefly. Another area that I won't talk about at all, and I'll give you an example of what we do in this area and in this area, and the rest of it I'm not going to talk much about in the, limits of, in, in, the, in the limited time available, but if you're interested, we can talk about it separately. Um, Wally Sobiejo, I stole this picture from him. He works on lightweight vehicles. I also work on lightweight vehicles. We're interested in developing metal alloys, aluminum and magnesium alloys that can be used for lightweight cars, for um, for uh, any vehicle you like, ships, airplanes, cars, et cetera. Obviously, that will improve their fuel efficiency. Another Energy Frontier Research Center that was just funded by the Department of Energy that I'm involved in and also my colleague uh, Miko Hataja is involved in is looking at new materials for solid oxide fuel cells. Um, the internal combustion engine is an incredibly efficient way of processing fuel. But another way that it has tremendous promise uh, for generating electricity is by taking fuels and actually uh, running them through um, a cell like this that, uh, that actually has the potential to be able to use dirty fuels even without, without problem. And so this is another mechanism for generating electricity either from hydrogen or from, or from uh, um, hydrocarbons. And then lastly, I'll just say that um, I just found out that um, another Department of Energy grant that I had pending uh, was funded to develop new materials for photovoltaics or for solar cells. And I have another one pending um, having to do with essentially doing what's called photocatalysis, which is to take sunlight and, and make liquid fuels. And um, hopefully that's going to get funded too. So these are all the areas that we're working in. And, um, and now I'll just spend uh, an, a minute telling you this slide is, is from one of my uh, now collaborators, because he is part of the uh, Ener Energy Frontier Research Center. Bill Green at MIT uh, put together this slide to just point out things that I don't even need to discuss in detail because Fred did such a good job already. But the point is we have to start thinking about a whole bunch of new fuels that are going to be coming online and how they operate, both understanding how to optimize uh, their combustion chemistry 
and the fluid dynamics involved in the, uh, in the, mix, the mixing of the chemistry and the, and the thermodynamics of, uh, with the fluid, with the, with the gas, and how to then take that information to understand how to design new engines. There are a lot of new engine technologies that are being considered. They all have quite different uh, regimes in terms of pressure and temperature that one needs to think about. And so this was the motivation, really, to, uh, to come up, to go to the Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences, and say, we want to put together a team that goes all the way from molecules, which is where I live, all the way up to engines, uh, to be able to optimize fuels and engines for clean combustion. And so that's what this, um, this is my, my little bit here, from molecules to engines. We have, uh, so I should say, the Department of Energy put out a call for proposals. They received 261 proposals. They funded 46 proposals. We're the only one funded on combustion. And, um, and Ed Law, who unfortunately is not here, he's the director. He suckered me into being the co-director. Um, and we don't yet know who the associate director will be. There are 15 people involved, including Fred and Yi Guang uh, Zhu, who's listed here. He's, Yi Guang's on the steering committee. Uh, Bill Green, I already introduced. There's people here from Sandia Combustion Research Facility, which is out in California, uh, who are experts. Uh, and then also experts from other universities, um, as well as um, also uh, someone from Argonne National Lab. And the idea is that all of us together are going to cover these areas of expertise, uh, both theory and experiment, chemistry, um, flames in terms of the fluid dynamics, uh, and, and also engine design. And so this is, really, this is really nascent. The money is not here yet. Okay? So we're just starting to think about how to put this together. And we're all very excited about it. So do I have a minute or not? I'm, am I done? Should I be done? OK, I'll just do this one slide then. So, so I'm, I, I hate it when people go over, and I don't want to be, I, I be a hypocrite. So uh, anyway, um, this is just one example of the kinds of things we do in terms of materials. So we, we are interested right now in uh, the material tungsten, which is, being, which is the prototype for the, one of the interior portions of this fusion reactor. And there are good reasons why one might want to use tungsten. You remember tungsten is actually what's the filament inside your light bulb, and it happens to be able to exist at very high temperatures. And that's a good thing. It has a high melting point. Also, it's a good neutron absorber. And the question that, they that Princeton Plasma Physics Lab posed to me was, how, how easily does it incorporate hydrogen or its isotopes? Because, that, because it's going to get bombarded with those materials. And, we, and we're very concerned about that. Because hydrogen in metals often causes problems. Okay? It, it's, a, it's an actor in corrosion. And so we've actually looked at this now. And, uh, and we haven't actually looked at the, at the problem of a neutron hitting metals. But we know that when neutrons hit metals, they knock atoms out of place. They form vacancies. Missing atoms are, are there. That's what this is supposed to mean. And it turns out that hydrogen loves those vacancies. They just go straight to the vacancies. Uh, and they live, many of them, Live that, that should have been an atom right there. And, the, and hydrogen, up to six hydrogen atoms can collect around those vacancies. And when you have that many hydrogen atoms, you, what we are able to do is calculate essentially what, uh, what we call an embrittlement function. When you gather that much hydrogen together, it, it essentially makes the material crack and blister. And so we made some predictions about how likely that happens as a function of temperature, which could be very useful in trying to understand how to look to optimize a, a tungsten alloy that will inhibit hydrogen incorporation. We've already done that kind of thing for steel. So with that, I'm going to skip all the thermal barrier coating work and just say, and, and thank Don Johnson, whose work I had a chance to talk about. And Don is somewhere in this picture. Where is he? He's right there. Okay. And so with that, and I, and so I should think Princeton Plasma Physics Lab and also Princeton School of Engineering, they jointly funded this small project having to do with hydrogen and tungsten. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm really speaking not just for myself, but for Professor Ju, who's in the back of the audience here, and Professor Law, and Professor Sokolo, all of whom are part of the Thermal Sciences Group in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Uh, let's see.
Let's see if I can. I want to emphasize the issue that we're most interested in is the idea of trying to reduce carbon emissions in net cycle over the next period of time. And you can see that we're talking about reductions here that are in the order of very large numbers in comparison to present CO emissions. In particular, the issue of transport and carbon emissions from transportation systems are thought to be one of the most difficult areas to deal with. And it's partly because of the size of the amount of energy that's being fluxed through the transportation system, as well as its source, which is principally petroleum. As such, we have to worry about backward compatibility for very large amounts of capital investment in terms of transportation systems, and also forward design issues. As we look at those issues, we can see that we want to keep some uh, uh, compatibility with the existing processing issues of petroleum. And what I want to emphasize is two points here. One is as we go to from Saudi Arabian petroleum to the kinds of things we'll be using for petroleum in the future, the amount of energy processing requirement be becomes very severe, principally because of hydrogen content in these fuels and the hydrogen upgrading necessary to shift the amount of hydrogen in the system towards what we want to use in real systems. This introduces a whole series of areas for producing hydrogen that are very important, but I think everyone now agrees that biomass is going to be a key to addressing these climate issues. The difficulty is that if we look at all of the renewable resources, including biomass, those numbers do not compare well with the total amount of energy production that we really require. For us as well, we have a very large amount of coal that's being used in electricity, and we know that China is going to increase its use in this area as well. So how do we deal with this? Well, there's at least two ways to process biomass. This is representative of one. I grow materials that have very high oil content. I extract the oil. I process the oil. And now you'll notice no oxygen in these systems. These are not the typical kinds of ethanol things that you and I are used to. They are now fully hydrocarbon compatible with petroleum products, as you see here on the left. I want to note one other thing here that's very important. These are the kinds of properties that are used to define what I put in a jet engine. If I go to a gasoline station and I collect gasoline today, tomorrow it's not the same. Next December, it's not the same at all. And if I do that in Asia or I do that here, it's very different. The question is, is how do I integrate these alternative fuels into those kind of problems? And this is why I need very strong compatibility. Now, why is this important? Because in comparison to kerosene derived from petroleum, this is the used CO2 emission that would have come from burning petroleum. But if I use any of these other oils, that use CO2 emission is replaced by the fact I so photosynthetically captured the CO2 from the atmosphere. The problem is each one of these oils represents only about 40% of the mass of the biomaterial I grew, and the biomaterial that I'm using is very resource limited. So the amount of fuel replacement that I can get is very limited this way. Can I use it better another way? This is the other way. Not only can I use it better, but I can also develop ways of using coal. You've all seen the clean coal ads recently. It really is clean. The idea is to use photosynthetic sequestration of CO2 from the atmosphere to displace the CO2 that's going to be present in the fuel when it is burned. I'm going to combine it with coal. I'm going to generate a liquid fuel. I'm going to simultaneously generate electricity so I'm replacing both the electrical generation market and the transportation fuel market simultaneously. The co-production of fuels and power turn out to achieve extremely good optimal economics with very good solutions of many of the environmental problems. Important here is, is that I can also eliminate very large amounts of the nanoparticle emissions that occur from pulverized coal firing by replacing it with gasification as the means of making uh, my gasified streams. In order to do synthetic fuel, to 
conversion. I need to remove sulfur, so I end up with very low sulfur fuels this way. In addition, I'm going to process some of the synthetic gases to power right on site. And you'll notice I've got two routes to that, one this way, one that way, that I can also use liquid fuels with it. This is to balance the two processes. So oxygen firing of such a gasification system also produces a CO2 stream, which is very pure in its process, can be dried easily, can be compressed, and can be carbon sequestered and stored. That's the key to this technology. How big of an advantage is this? As I showed you here, we got about an 85% reduction in C emissions. If I do this purely with bio mass in this problem, bio to liquids plus electricity, I get a minus 22% carbon reduction in comparison to petroleum. If I do this with 38% biomass with coal, I get a zero net carbon cycle out of this process. I'd be happy to share more about the economics of this. This comes from an analysis with my colleagues, uh, Bob Williams, Eric Larson, and the Princeton Environmental Institute here. So you can see that if I use one of these processes of CBTL, coal plus biomass to liquids with full recycle, carbon capture and storage, or once through, I can generate very good economic solutions to this problem. Turns out not the one that produces most liquid fuel is the best. This is, it's called systems analysis. I need to know a lot about heat rejection in these systems and its quality to pick that one. Okay, well, now what's the problem? This all looks very simple. The problem is this is what the molecular weight distribution looks like in any of the fuels we use for transportation. And we don't know how all of those little molecular weight distributions change every time I make an alternative fuel. I need to find ways of compatibility between alternative fuels and petroleum so I don't disrupt the distribution or storage or utility in any of these systems. So these are the questions that need to be answered and these are the questions that the Thermal Sciences Group are addressing. We have a number of projects and I'll try to keep everybody online here. Uh, we have a project called uh, the Carbon Mitigation Initiative that's directed out of PEI, of uh, which uh, Steve Bacala and Rob Sokolo are the PIs. It's funded by BP and Ford. We have a next generation aircraft fuel project looking specifically at this problem for aircraft fuels and for producing very low net carbon emissions and particulates. That's PEI by me and involves the people you'll note here all at Princeton. We have a Air Force MURI program, which involves a number of other institutions and PEI as well. And we are looking at how to model real fuels with what are called surrogate mixtures of small numbers of molecules. A similar program involves Professor Law. That's a station on the West Coast, PEI by uh, Professor Agapopoulos at USC. You'll notice another set of industries, and you'll note who's funding this. Air Force is a big player in this area. And finally, we have hydrogen combustion in gas turbines. This is an issue with the syngas power generation problem and controlling emissions. We've been working with Nettle and also Siemens. And finally, just recently, we have gotten an Energy Frontiers Research Center award from Basic Energy Sciences which Emily will tell you a little bit more about. Uh, so this gives you a kind of a broad picture of what thermal science is, in, is involved in here. We work on the fire safety aspects of this, on the fuel property aspects, and you'll notice the kinds of things you're talking about in terms of real-time sensing are very important for control of these kinds of systems. Thank you.
As uh, Pablo mentioned, uh, I'm entrepreneur in residence here. One of my functions is to meet with uh, faculty and students about uh, you know, ideas for starting new companies or spinning off technologies. And you know, I've enjoyed uh, that part of my being here. But uh, let me start off with what, the perp what I see the purpose of this meeting is. Uh, first of all, does this make sense? You know, now, to me, it makes a lot of sense. But I'd rather hear that from you than uh, you know, my own thoughts. Uh, give you an opportunity to see what faculty are working on here. Uh, faculty can see what the local companies are doing. Uh, it's a lot better to meet and interact and have coffee and we have a reception afterwards rather than just read about stuff in uh, newspapers and trade journals. And of course is to determine what the next steps are. How do we go forward from here? So after this meeting we'll kind of you know, make some notes, distribute them and go to plan B. A uh, little bit of history. You know, Princeton's had a number of really successful uh, industrial academic uh, interactions. And I just put three of them up here, but uh, there are many more. These are the ones I've been involved with. Uh, about 20 years ago, there was a POEM Center for uh, Photonics and Optoelectronic Materials. Jim Sturm was heavily involved in uh, creating that. Uh, PRISM, that, that sort of morphed into Princeton, which combined uh, materials uh, with the optoelectronics. Uh, and then finally, uh, most recently, we have MIRTH with uh, Prof. Claire Gamakel, and I'm not going to uh, steal her thunder. I'll let, you, uh, let her tell you about it. But that's also been a very successful uh, industrial interaction. Uh, just to give you my personal uh, interaction, my history with Princeton and these types of academic uh, uh, interactions. Uh, I've had two startup companies, one Epitax in 1984 and the second one is called Sensors Unlimited. Uh, Epitax was more fiber optics, Sensors Unlimited was fiber optics and also infrared imaging. Um, I got involved with Steve Forrest who was on the faculty. He joined in 1992. About the same time, uh, Marshall Cohen and I started uh, Sensors Unlimited. And it was really a synergistic thing. And POEM, which was then the Industrial uh, Affiliates Center, really provided the nucleus for us to interact. Steve was coming uh, in. He needed to set up his uh, equipment, get his students going. We were starting a company. You know, we had engineers, but we didn't have a lot of equipment and facilities. So via joint R&D programs, we were able to share these things and both you know, really benefited from them. Uh, lots of student jobs, not only summer jobs. I think at Census, we probably hired maybe close to uh, 10 uh, Princeton graduates. Uh, we licensed patents. Uh, it was just a really nice interaction. Uh, between these two companies, NetNet, uh, there was over a billion dollars in, in sale, uh, over a thousand jobs were created, and one of the best part is we were able to pay back over a hundred million dollars to the government in the form of corporate and payroll taxes. So it was really a win-win-win for everybody, and I give a lot of the credit for both of these companies to you know, the centers that existed at Princeton University. So what I'm trying to do is to tell you it's really worked for me and it can work for you too by getting involved with the university. Uh, as I said, it's been a great deal for everybody. Um, again, uh, the Mirth Center, I'm going to let uh, Prof. Gamakel tell you more about that. But uh, they've attracted companies from all over the United States that participate in it. Uh, in fact, I was down at uh, a, a trade show called Clio uh, last week in Baltimore, and I see they had their own. Uh, booth at a trade show. So, uh, you know, it's really been an active organization and really gets out and interacts uh, with the world. Now, you know, if I was an industrial member, you know, if I hadn't been involved in these things, I might say, well, how can a university help me? And, you know, just a couple, I think you're going to find out by listening to these talks. Uh, but I, I think one of the best ways is by joint funding programs. Um, my companies have used the SBIR system, Small Business Innovation Research. It's a funding system the government has for small businesses. 
But now with the stimulus program, there's a lot of other things going on. The Department of Energy, most recently these ARPA-E programs, but there are going to be more as the stimulus stuff evolves. And many, many of these programs either encourage or require uh, companies to interact, to have universities on their programs, and vice versa, for universities to go out and find industrial participation. So I think the stimulus program is you know, just one of many ways that this can interact. You know, at first glance, nanotechnologies and lasers, you know, wh what does that have to do with me? Well, you know, that may sound a little foreign to you or a little bit up in the clouds, but when you get into pollution monitoring and gas sensing, uh, then it's not so far removed, because I think a lot of you uh, deal with things like that. Um, let's turn it around. How can companies help universities? Just make them aware of the problems you have. Uh, an outlet for technology. There's a lot of great technology here, and if you get to talk to the people, uh, this is how you'll find out. Uh, I can tell you from my own experience, Princeton's very easy to work with. Um, you know, John Ritter, in, in terms of licensing, he's, he's just he's a deal maker. You, know, and you won't sit there for you know, tens of meetings or get to the point. And, uh, we found them, we've worked with them for over 20 years, and we found not just John, but the whole university to be really easy uh, and, and friendly to work with. So I think that's the end of my comments. Uh, I think next on the uh, schedule is supposed to be the funding lady, uh, Paula Durand. I, I don't see her here yet. So I think what we'll do is uh, maybe start on, if, if you don't mind starting a little early, Claire, um, get on with that part of it. And when Paula comes in, we'll just have her talk about the uh, funding programs available for the state. Well, good afternoon. Um, figuring that I had 10 minutes, I figured I would uh, focus on one example to tell you one specific aspect of our work on organic solar cells. Um, before I did that, I thought it was important for me to share with you some statistics. Um, so I gathered this information. Um, and so if you're, you've seen this, uh, bear with me for a couple of moments here. So if you look at the global population, the global population stands at about 6.4 million people. And of those 6.4 million people, about 300 million reside in the United States. That makes it 5% of the global population. Now, if you ask the question of how much energy we consume, the global energy consumption stands at about 460 quadrillion BTUs. That's British thermal units. And quadrillion is 10 to the 15. Of those 460 quadrillion BTUs, about 100 quadrillion BTUs is being consumed in the United States. Okay? Those are all big numbers. So what do these big numbers mean? If you take these numbers, divide by the population, and then divide by the number of days there are in a year, and then divide by, let's say, the energy density of gasoline, what you get out is that the world consumes energy equivalent to one and a half gallons of gasoline per person per day. And the United States then consume energy equivalent to seven and a half ga gallons of gasoline per person per day. So this is quite an alarmingly large number, considering that we probably don't even drink a gallon of water per person per day. Okay. And from this number, you'd gather that, yeah, I mean, there is an eminent need for us to find renewable energy that is A, sustainable, B, has negligible impact on the environment. And that's why we look towards the sun. So I'm showing you here the spectral radiance of the sun. Okay, the solar radiance is at one kilowatt per meter squared. And if you take those units, what this means is the annual uh, sunlight gives energy at about 3.6 million quadrillion BTUs. If you do that same kind of analysis, what this means is if we can effectively and efficiently harness solar energy for an hour, that's enough to power human activity across the globe for an entire year. Hence, this motivation and this drive for solar energy and solar, uh, solar research. So solar cells are used to convert sunlight to electrical energy. First gen solar cells are these single crystalline type silicon devices. The thermodynamic efficiency, so this is the maximum achievable efficiency that these devices can, can hit, is about 33%.
In the lab, they've been demonstrated to be a, between 20 to 25 percent. Now, if you inc incorporate them as modules and you put them on roofs, their efficiency drops a little bit, so it's about 18 percent. The biggest problem with these first generation solar cell is the cost. Okay? They're way too expensive compared to coal. So there is this next generation or second generation solar cells. These are thin film devices, so they're polycrystalline. That drops the cost significantly, but here you take a hit in the efficiency as well. Uh, the materials that are used to make these uh, thin film devices are cadmium, um, telluride, for example. They're rare earth metals. Uh, they could be uh, toxic. And so we wanted to ask a different question. So I'm plotting here efficiency as a function of cost, reminding you that Gen 1 solar cells are right about here. Gen 2 solar cells are right here. So these are the thin film devices. Gen 3 devices we didn't talk about. These are the ones with fancier architecture. And so they're more expensive, but they're also more efficient. What the organic electronics community is asking is whether we can target right about there. We take a hit in efficiency, but we can dramatically lower costs. Indeed, market analysis that's been done has shown that if we can make about 10% efficient devices, we're in business. Okay? So that's the question we want, we want to ask. Just quickly, let me show you how an, organic solar, how, how an organic solar cell is built and how it works. So here you typically start out with a glass or a plastic substrate. Okay? You have a transparent anode. And then you put down your organic layers. You need an organic uh, electron donor, and you need an electron acceptor. And then you put on your cathode. So here are energy levels that are associated with the donor and the acceptor. So this is the LUMO level and the HOMO level, or the conduction band and the valence band. And so when you shine light, light gets absorbed in, um, in, the, in the donor. And then you generate an exciton. This is a tightly bound electron and hole pair. Uh, the electron then shifts to the LUMO level, and the hole remains in the HOMO level. And these get collected at the external electrodes. So Solar cells are inherently not very efficient devices. Organic solar cells especially are not very efficient. The highest efficiency that's been reported a couple years ago is about 6%. Okay? And you can begin to understand why that is the case. The efficiency that's associated with a device is a compound of all these different efficiencies. So if you have one single step that's not efficient, that sort of propagates onwards. To characterize these devices, you plot the current density as a function of voltage, and you get a diode curve. And it's really the area here that's below the zero line that gives you how efficient your device is. The bigger the area, the better your devices are. Now I'd like to call your attention back to how these devices are made. You'll notice that these devices are often built from the bottom up. Okay? You put down one layer, and then you put down the second layer, you put down the third layer. And that's because I mean, we're following what's been established for the silicon industry. But organic is a completely different beast. They are frequently mechanically and chemically fragile. And so if you're using the same technologies to put down and pattern uh, the cathode, for example, on the organic layers, you can potentially damage the organic layers. And so what we'd like to focus on is come up with non-invasive non processing technologies to make these devices. So here in this example, I'm showing you how we can laminate to make organic devices. So the idea here is as follows. You want to make these devices separately, okay? the, di the different components separately. And then in one final step, you bring them together. So in this example, we've basically patterned and deposited electrodes separate from the active layer. Here we're using polydimethylsiloxane. Uh, this is silicone. This has the chem same chemical structure as the RTV that you use to caulk your bathtub. Um, you, you can pattern and deposit your electrodes without harming the photoactive layer. And then when you're ready, you laminate to make contact. Now, there are several merits associated with this lamination procedure. First of all, you have this modular construction of devices. So you can individually optimize the different layers. Second of all, uh, you have custom engineering of the interfaces. So I've mentioned that charge extraction is a problem. You can imagine putting down chemical species here that can enhance charge extraction. And this is something that you can't easily do when you're building things from the bottom up. Finally, you can imagine doing this over large areas. And if you do this over a large area, it can potentially enhance, uh, enhance, enhance fast throughput uh, combinatorial testing of new materials. So we're working with a chemist right now uh, who's going to synthesize a bunch of these new materials. And so we can inkjet print them down and laminate and test them really quickly combinatorially. 
So I wanted to show some uh, data. So here are current density plotted against voltage for different contacts that we've made to the same photoactive layer. So we're putting down one contact, we're taking it off, we're putting down a second one, and then we're taking it off and we're putting down a third one. The point of this graph is to show you that this technique is actually really robust. It does not depend on the contact that you're making. What you're testing really is the characteristics of the photoactive layer. Now looking to the future, how scalable is this process? We believe this process is scalable and it's compatible to roll-to-roll -roll processing. So these are processing technologies that have been developed and established for the newspaper industry, for magazines and whatnot. And if you take potato chip bags, for example, where they're depositing aluminum, and these are the specifications for depositing aluminum, if you use those specifications as a benchmark, you only really need about 100 machines to operate for a year to make 10% efficient solar cells. Now, of course, I'm not saying that organic solar is the way to go, but using the sun is clearly going to be one of the ways, and, and we think this is a good way to move forward. Oh. So just to show you that printing is possible, so these, are, these aren't solar cells, but these are sort of uh, backplanes for displays that we've printed uh, using sort of similar technologies. So I'd like to spend the next uh, few minutes telling you a little bit about the Anlinger Center and some of the logistics about uh, this meeting. Um, the Anlinger Center, uh, as many of you may know, was established in July of 2008, thanks to an extraordinary gift from Princeton alumnus and international business leader Gerhard Anlinger. The center has three core areas of research. So we would like the center to support a vibrant research and teaching program with a focus on three things, developing new alternative energy sources, improving the efficiency of devices that consume and generate energy today, and inventing and improving carbon capture and storage techniques that will enhance our ability to reduce the amount of CO2 entering the atmosphere. So these are three broad themes. The center aims at pursuing these studies closely with scientists and policy analysts across the university. And this is very important, with an eye towards translating fundamental knowledge into practical solutions. This is built into the core mission of the center. We envision the center to be located in what we call a neighborhood, energy and the environment neighborhood, which will comprise the E-wing of the engineering school Bowen Hall, which is where the Prism Center uh, stands, and the Carfield Center, which will move across the street, where uh, we, we intend to have a, a very nice conference center in that location associated with the Anlinger Center. And there will be, very importantly, a state-of-the-art facility. A major theme will be within the center will be to bring together the finest minds in energy and environmental science with those who work on new materials. This was a strategic choice that Princeton made to capitalize on an existing strength. For example, to develop flexible solar panels or to develop heat resistance coatings that will enable power plants to operate more efficiently. And you're going to hear about both of these themes today. So accordingly, the new center will host a state-of-the-art facility, a shared facility that will have state-of-the-art imaging and nanofabrication facilities in addition to individual investigator labs. Because of the focus on translating fundamental knowledge into practical solutions, close interactions with industry will be to, from day one, fundamental to the existence of the center. And planning for the new building therefore includes space for industrial collaboration laboratories, as well as for hosting industrial visitors for extended periods of time. We selected the architects in January, uh, Todd Williams and Billy Zine, a firm, a New York-based firm, and we're in the middle of the design process for the center. The search committee has identified the 
candidate for the director of the center, and we're now in the middle of negotiations trying to track this person to Princeton. So we're very excited. We're sort of in the, in the quiet but very active phase. A lot of things are happening. Speaking about the director, uh, in, 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 in going with the theme of the importance of industrial contacts, the director will consult with two external advisory boards. One will be focused on scientific issues and will be primarily but not exclusively academic. And the other board will be focused on strategic and policy concerns and will be mostly composed of people from industry. In addition, the director will oversee the recruiting of new faculty to the center, will oversee the development of the energy and environment neighborhood, provide leadership of research, educational, and outreach activities, and also, very importantly, allocate a non-trivial amount of funds for innovative research internally at Princeton. So today's meeting is the first of what we hope to be many meetings. And when we thought about the format, of course, we didn't know what sort of response we would get. We got a very good response. And so we have to cram everyone into just 10 minutes. So the format will be talks. We have two coffee breaks and a reception for people to mingle and, and follow up. We want the industrialists to hear about the exciting research going on here and programs that exist. And we want the academics to hear about the needs and interests in industry. And hopefully, the two coffee breaks and the reception will allow for plenty of opportunity for people to talk. If time allows and we're doing OK with the uh, timing, right before the reception, we'll also have a little bit of open discussion. But if you don't have enough of structured discussion, Please be proactive. Contact the faculty members or the faculty members. Contact the industrial members whose presentations you're interested in. And be aware that this is just the first of many forums that we intend to organize. Um, this is all I wanted to say. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Greg Olson, who is my partner in crime in organizing this. Greg is a lecturer in the Electrical Engineering Department and, of course, is president and founder of GHO Ventures. Jeff? Thank you. I can use this. Clicker, it's all right. Answer. It's okay. This is fine. All right. Um, as Greg said, I'm a senior venture officer with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Um, I specialize in clean technology on the technology and life sciences team. We have a couple of people specializing in certain other areas. And since I came on board about two years ago, um, this was my specialty. And um, was, have been working to fund companies in this area and also create programs to um, address this segment of the uh, industry. So um, for those who are not familiar with the Economic Development Authority, we're an independent state agency. Um, we're, we like to say that if the government shuts down, we're still operating because we're not under a line item budget. Oh, OK, fine. All right. <laughs> Um, these are the um, uh, areas we cover, financing assistance, access to small business services, real estate development. Um, for those who have driven along Route 1, if you've seen um, uh, where uh, Chubb Institute is, we actually own an incubator for life science companies. And um, recently, we actually took commerce into the Economic Development Agency. And so we have an international trade area, which is interesting because uh, before where I was um, or have been focusing on New Jersey companies and attracting companies outside New Jersey to um, the state, I'm actually now meeting with a lot of international companies who are really interested in moving to New Jersey or investing in companies in New Jersey. So um, actually, Israel is very high among states, um, countries that are looking to um, invest in um, clean tech uh, companies here, but also China. So those are the two countries I've been um, meeting with. So there is a life cycle of companies that we fund. And a lot of people become confused as far as what does the Economic Development Agency do versus other 
uh, state agency. So this is a little chart that I um, actually put together this morning just to kind of show the progression. It's the New Jersey Commission of Science and Technology, and that really funds very basic research and development projects. Um, and um, as you move along the curve, uh, we have an Edison Innovation Suite of programs. Those are the programs that I represent. And the reason why we have a specialized team is our partners are primarily the venture capital firms, the angel investors, there's equity funds. Um, and so this, these are the companies that um, are startups primarily. Uh, they don't have revenues, there's losses, and um, they really require a specialized team and specialized type of financing versus the more traditional mature companies, and there's a group at the Economic Development Agency, and those are the traditional companies and where they look for two-year profitable history. You can imagine that those are the companies that really partner with our commercial banks. Um, so we, are, we, we like to say that we have financing that goes from the very, very early prototype stage, and then we move forward to very advanced um, and larger companies, but we are there to support the technology industry, and especially clean technology. And uh, the focus here is really what we're doing to really support that in the state. And so there's a New Jersey Energy Master Plan. It was um, released in October 2008. It's supposed to be updated every three years. I think it was quite a long time before this one came out. But it does list a series of goals, and that provides a blueprint for our programs that we are uh, creating in order to support these goals. And the goals are listed there, and you can see um, uh, we're looking to achieve 30% of the state's electricity needs, tr electricity needs from renewable sources by 2020. And in order to do that, we have to really be much more aggressive and um, rolling out programs to really um, service this community, and that's what we're doing now. The last bullet point is important only because the investing in innovative clean energy technologies and businesses is really the focus of what the Economic Development Agency is doing at this time, because we really take that policy and we implement it um, in action. And so, as you can see, um, these are some of the goals of the Energy Master Plan and how it affects the Economic Development Agency because our role is really to expand the current suite of programs that um, when I looked at it two years ago when I came in and I thought this really doesn't address the needs of the clean tech community because the maximum that any one clean tech company could get would be $1 million. And $1 million doesn't go a long way for a lot of capital expenditures. And so I spent a lot of time looking at other states, calling companies in other states, and saying, what can we do to really bring New Jersey to the forefront and bring it to where it should be? Um, so when people talk about California and how innovative it is, they're going to start talking about New Jersey. And I think we've done that because about three weeks ago, the um, the firm that is employed by the California Regulatory Commission called us, or actually called me, and said, I was reading about your programs, and I think they're very innovative, and could you assist us in creating a solar incentive program for California? Which I then said that I work for New Jersey, and I wasn't really ready to move, but it was a couple years ago, we probably would never have received that phone call. And so it's really encouraging that we are coming along the curve. And so where is this funding coming from? It definitely can't come from the Economic Development Agency because um, like many of the banking functions, we've been impacted by companies that are not paying us back on our um, regular um, amortization schedules. And we've had to um, stretch repayments out. And therefore, as income goes down, we don't have as much money to support clean energy programs. So the question is, is where, where will we get them? Um, the first program that's actually out there, the Clean Energy Manufacturing Fund program to support renewable energy manufacturers, is coming from the BPUs, the Board of Public Utilities, our regulator in the state, the Clean Energy Program Fund. And that's from the societal benefit charge that everyone pays into the local utilities 
It then is funded into the Board of Public Utilities and it's used to create energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. It's from that pot of funds that I created the Clean Energy Manufacturing Fund. But we have a couple of other pools that have come in um, from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cooperative um, state effort that New Jersey is part of to um, cap our greenhouse gas emissions. We do have a pool of funding coming in for that. And it's, it's, it's about 30 to 35 million per year, and we are mandated to use that to uh, roll out new programs. There's the Retail Margin Fund, which is legislation that was recently passed in March 2009 to uh, support combined heat and power. And then there's the Federal Stimulus Fund that everyone seems to be chasing. But in reality, um, our part of it that we're rolling out into programs is not a lot. It's only 15 million out of about 70. Uh, four million that's allocated to New Jersey. And so I wanted to put this in perspective and um, I just want to say that some of these went to our EDA board today. So it's really hot off the press, May 12th. Um, and there's a 10 day waiting period for the governor to approve these programs. So until it's really officially approved, I can't um, go into all the details, but I can at least highlight for you what they are. Um, the first one is the Energy, uh, Edison Innovation Clean Energy Manufacturing Fund. Actually, that was approved last year. Um, there's $24 million supported from the Board of Public Utilities for that. We had one solicitation already at the beginning of the year, and we've opened up another solicitation that um, uh, as of June 1st. So uh, within, the, within the month, um, uh, the state will be announcing who the um, winners of are of the, uh, the first solicitation, but there's still quite a lot of funding available for the second one. So if you are a clean energy or energy efficiency manufacturer and you can meet what we call class one, according to the Board of Public Utilities, which is photovoltaics, wind, um, uh, tidal, and some other uh, technologies out there, then that this is a pool of funding I would encourage you to apply for. Uh, the window actually um, ends July 14th for anyone in this room who's thinking of applying. The second one is, um, it's called Clean Energy Solutions Capital Investment Loan Grant Program. I'm not sure why everyone has to come up with these long names because I think it's just a tongue twister really for the fact that these are funds um, that are coming from the uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative to support Energy, end use energy efficiency projects. And um, there's going to be about 36 million available. And this program is very important for companies to note, will be online as of Monday. And so, therefore, and I'll go into the particulars, you'll see that 36 million is not going to be a lot. And it's a first come, first serve type of program. So, if you think that you may qualify, I would say check the website and apply as soon as possible. I can go through some of the particulars in a couple of next slides. This other one was just approved this morning at the board, the Edison Innovation Projects Program. Um, that's from the federal stimulus program uh, funding. It's only $15 million. I say only 15 because each project can go up to 5 million. So there's not gonna be a lot of uh, funding for this, but it's going to cover the whole array of renewable energy, energy efficiency. Um, it's going to be for biomass. It's going to be for energy storage. Um, it could be for combined heat and power, um, and also alternative fuels. So um, I wanted to let you know that, that again, there's a 10-day waiting period, so I won't go through the whole um, highlights of this, but it's really primarily for those companies that have a proof of concept. It's not for the very early stage. And then um, the Research and Development Fund Wraparound is something that accompanies the research and development grants that are available. There's 15 million available this year. And yeah, uh, okay, two minutes. Um, so um, wanted to mention that. And then there's the Combined Heat and Power Program. And then that's from our Retail Margin Fund. $60 million is available for this. And this will really launch us into some really massive 
uh, waste to um, energy type of projects. This is the Clean Energy Manufacturing Fund. 3.3 .3 million in grants and interest rate free loans are available for this. And as I said, the solicitation began June 1st. And then this is the uh, program that it will be launched on Monday from the um, proceeds from the cap and trade program. And those are the, and these are the categories of fund uses. Uh, so if you're installing equipment for combined heat and power for end use energy efficiency projects, and that does include solar, um, state of the art projects and innovative carbon emission abatement technologies, this would apply. I would mention that for any type of solar installations, um, they've modified it so that if this is a grant and zero interest rate program up to $5 million. But for those that are solar projects, because it's heavily incentivized, it's going to be loan only and it could be repaid from solar renewable energy certificates. So these are the guidelines that will be introduced on the uh, website on Monday. One million is the minimum, a very attractive interest rate. You're not going to get that in the pro private sector. Um, and long repayment period, as you can see, up to 20 years. And um, the reason why I think this will go fast is because institutional is in there. So there's a lot of hospitals that want to do combined heat and power projects, among other type of entities. So this is the 866 number, but a lot of people know me in the room and I have no problem sitting down, going through your requirements, and assisting you as you move forward. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute